participation. And uh, in the Netherlands we do research, we collect best practices uh, from the Dutch field. Um, and right at this moment we were invited here in Helsinki to present to you uh, the latest developments together with the team, with Tommy Latitsov, Demos. Uh, we developed the program and I'm very happy uh, to give the word to Martijn de Bau, who uh, made the program together with us and Martijn will introduce our speakers this afternoon. Uh, also tomorrow we have a program and also I think Martijn will tell you more about it. Martijn. Yeah, thanks uh, Floor. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to the Dutch Culture Days at the pavilion of the World Design Capital here in Helsinki. Um, thank you, Dennis Helsinki, for inviting us to share with you some innovative examples from e-culture from the Netherlands. And e-culture is, uh, as we already explained, it's somewhere at the crossroads of technology, art, um, innovation. Um, and today and tomorrow we will share a number of best practices from the Netherlands with you. What we will be doing today is we will explore the future of storytelling. So how does new media, how do digital media, how do they change the way that we really can tell stories or that we can experience stories? And I think it does so on a number of levels. Um, obviously the, the first level that it changes storytelling is on the level of the image itself. Digital media gives us a lot of new opportunities to create images in, in new ways. Um, in animation, for example. Um, and we can also layer um, images in new ways. So we can have animation to live footage. We can start thinking about data visualization as a new way to tell stories. Um, digital media also changes storytelling at the level of the story. We can add interactive elements, we can add maybe a little gameplay to stories, it's not longer a linear story, and of course it does so at the level where um, the maker, the storyteller, interacts with the audience. Also there we see a lot of innovation where storytellers reach out to audiences in new ways. And we brought three examples from the Netherlands that will explore these various levels, and I'm going to uh, introduce them to you. Uh, we have today uh, the Netherlands from above, it will be presented by Jasper Koning from Vibrio Broadcasting Organization in the Netherlands. And um, the Netherlands from above is a very special program broadcasted on Dutch TV. And, and really what they did is they turned boring Excel sheets in really exciting and beautiful imagery and, and stories that were shown on national television. It was a huge success in the Netherlands. We also have with us Renko Vlaanderen, he's from Submarine Channel. And Submarine Channel is um, it's an online platform for digital storytelling in the Netherlands. And he will share with us the Art of Foe. It's one of their latest projects. And it's a feature direct, future direction for comics and graphic novels. So what, what happens with comics and graphic novels when you add animation, when you add sound, when you add maybe interactivity. But we start off uh, first, and it's an honor to introduce it to you, uh, for Sky. He is a creative ambassador of The Hague. He's a filmmaker and visual artist from the Netherlands, and he has made lots of more or less traditional animation films. He was nominated uh, from the Netherlands for the Oscars in 2011 for his film uh, The Origin of Creatures. And his work has been shown at film festivals all around the world and in museums yeah, like the Centre Pompidou in Paris and in the Paul Klee Museum in Bern. Um, some of you might not know him as uh, Forrest Kuyk, but as his alter ego, Jarno Sneets. I don't know if anyone has heard of him. Uh, you can see a picture of him there. Of the, he is the guy with the, the big wings. Because um, as Jarno Sneets, uh, Forrest Kuyk shared with the audience through his blog his dream of one day being able to fly uh, like a bird. And, and he shared his attempt to build his own human bird wings with an audience worldwide, and in the end, millions of people actually saw him off, taking off into the sky. And Floris is going to tell us how he did this project. Floris, please welcome Floris Guy. Thank you very much for this introduction. And thanks for uh, being here. It's really nice to be in Helsinki. Um, as Martijn already told, uh, I'm a filmmaker. And therefore, I would like to start this presentation with a short compilation of the videos I made so far. It's only two minutes, and then you get a picture of uh, what I do as a film. These metal flyers are 
shrine, the nest. Because the nest is made of metal, rainwater forms a serious rust hazard. They suck up the raindrops on the nest and spit them out. Sections of the body disappear completely to be replaced by solid metal tissue.
So he's taken this new technology and he's very close to making it a reality. No, he's not very close at all. He didn't get in the air. He spent 10 years doing this and he can't get in the no, air. And he just started in the last three months. He never got around to it. It's like his grandpa apparently spent his whole life kind of toying with this and never built it.
So together with these three ingredients, I started uh, working on the Human Birdwings project, on the concept, and uh, gathering a team. And one of the team mem members was David Mendy, an engineer from the University of Eindhoven. And I asked him to uh, develop a wing system with the use of uh, Wii controllers and HCC smartphones. Um, and well, this is, this is a picture of the drawing. And we spent a lot of time on the drawing table to make it as uh, plausible as possible. And this is one of the wild sketches which came out. A system in which we use HCC smartphone and a Wii controller. We use the acceleration sensors of it and uh, deliver the data of the acceleration sensors to the speed controller, which would be able to give uh, motors extra power to stimulate uh, the, uh, or to assist the power of the, the wings. So we would be able to not only move the wings with our own muscles, but also with, uh, with little engines on the back of the arms. Um, as soon as we had the idea and the concept of, uh, for the wings, we started to introduce the character of Janus Space and we used various social media platforms for it. Uh, Facebook uh, together, some kind of a fan base and a friend base for Jano. Sorry. Uh, started following uh, Jano through Twitter. And we also had this LinkedIn profile to make a more realistic uh, background story for Jarno. So people would think, hey, that's an engineer, and he's the guy who could change history by building his own uh, flapping wings. Uh, we also, well, the heart of the story was a, a blog in which we shared all the process on the wings, but also sketches and interviews with professors, research, uh, inspiration. And there was also uh, a YouTube channel where people could react on it and um, well, we use all these various platforms to tell the human version story. I hear, here I have a compilation of a few of the first videos of Jarno. Uh, I try to base it on the visual style of existing do-it-yourself projects, so it looks a bit amateuristic and uh, video blog style, but that makes it more believable, I think. This is a compilation of a few videos from Jarno's blog. Hey, I'm Jano, and on this video channel and on my WordPress blog, I'm going to share my personal DIY project. Hey guys, I'm here in Amsterdam at the Museum Square, and I'm going to talk with Brett Otten about my flying concept. I think it's more exciting, your plan is more exciting, because you want to have movable wings. You can see a little dozen, so pretty lightweight. If you look a little closer, we noticed that the harness will be in it. I think I can't do this completely on my own, so... But if you're living around the Hague in the Netherlands, uh, please send me a message uh, through YouTube, Facebook or Twitter, or just send me an email. And let me know if you're able to come out and help me build in these wings. <coughs> With this last video, uh, I asked people to come over and help. And uh, a lot of people started reacting on it and offering their help, their help. Also from the Technical University Delft. But because it was a fictional story, we couldn't invite them for real. So we decided to introduce another, a few other characters uh, and, and then we also started to participate on uh, forums on the internet like home built airplanes and some science forums and asked our questions and people reacted on it and with all this information uh, we used it in our wing design so people could also uh, yeah, help Jarno out with building these wings. That was the first phase of the project, this, uh, also for creating some kind of a fan base and followers. And then we started to uh, try to reach a bigger audience through Twitter and Facebook. Um, well, it really, really worked out well because uh, a lot of people started to react on it and uh, the visitors on the blog increased very much. And there was also this idea of if I are uh, introducing other characters in the story. Uh, there was a girl, Flora Peterson, also a fictional character, which we made a, a blog for. And yeah, Flora Peterson was supposed to be a student and uh, writing a thesis about how dreams influence human behavior. And she got interested in Jana's project because Jana was living his dream. And 
but we soon discovered that the storyline didn't really work out very well. So we decided that Floor would be the camera woman uh, and the editor for all the videos. And we also introduced some other characters, the friends of Jarno, and they helped building the wings. This is, uh, again, another video compilation with a few videos from the blog. He's going to film the complete process. He's friends. we also started approaching traditional media uh, like uh, Dutch television uh, broadcaster TV West and they came visit Jarno in the studio and um, made an item about Jarno and his wings. Uh, there was also a Belgian magazine, uh, a very large Belgian magazine, who came over to Jarno's studio and did an interview with him, which resulted in a three pages interview in the Humo Belgian magazine. And, uh, during the months, also, several blogs started to get interested, like Engadget.com, TechCrunch, Wired. Uh, we had an interview in the Financial Times in Germany. So, slowly, uh, our fan base also grew. And then we worked towards a climax in which Jano would do his first test flight, uh, somewhere in a park in The Hague. And, um, well, a lot of fuss a lot of buzz happened when Jana only got one meter of the ground, one meter of the ground, because it was also a very revolutionary. And after this video I posted from his first test flight, uh, Wired, Wired.com, uh, one of the scientists wrote a very interesting article about Jano and his wings, and uh, they had some kind of a scientific analysis, um, like you see on these pictures. But at the same time, a lot of people started to have doubts about it uh, because I made a mistake in my computer animations. Uh, in, the one, in one shot there was a black spot on the wing and in the other there wasn't. So people started analyzing these uh, mistakes, which was uh, really disappointing for me at that moment. But they also started digging in Jana's profile. And uh, this is a, a screenshot from a, from a forum in which people started to look at Jarno's photographs. I made one Photoshop picture of Jarno in a hang glider and for some reason somebody discovered the original picture I used from Google Images and he posted this uh, animated <laughs> gift. So in a way Jarno was already busted before the final climax of the story uh, was approached or was uh, arrived. So we decided to keep the project quiet for uh, a few months and then, after three months or so, we posted, suddenly we posted the, the final video of Jarno flying in a park in The Hague, and that's this video.
because this incredible flight was made by using a computer animation, uh, and I used my skills as a computer animation to make some kind of a, a believable first test of second test flight of Yarno. And um, because it looked so realistic, a lot of people also believed it. And this is a media compilation of what happened after I posted this video. It's a lot of uh, media attention. Jarno Smith can fly like a bird. Flying like a bird. And 500 years after Leonardo da Vinci dreamed of man taking to the sky, it's called human bird. Dutch engineer called Jarno Smith. Take a look, here's a so-called bird man. A Dutch man is sky high after he says his incredible invention took flight. Hey guys, so just stop flying like a bird. Diese Woche verleiht das Internet Flügel. And this last video was of a guy, he kind of copied Jarno's video, uh, but he used very small wings, so it was a, <laughs> a nice joke. Um, and together with all this press attention, also the critics started to uh, come look again. And um, there was a, a blog which uh, the last video was posted on, it's called Engadget, and uh, also Gizmodo, and they didn't they had the feeling that there wasn't uh, was something not right, so they approached uh, ILM, that's the, the visual effects studio of George Lucas, the creator of Star Wars, and the visual effects visual effects team of Star Wars. They started analyzing the video of Yarno, and they say, well, this must be uh, a fake because they noticed some tricks I used as a computer animator. Uh, and soon, a lot of more people started doubting about it, and uh, Yarno Smates became the lying Dutchman instead of the flying Dutchman. <laughs> uh, they also started to analyze the clothes of Jarno because someone noticed that he uses the same clothes in the first test flight as he used in the second test flight. And this right picture here uh, in the corner is of uh, the same scientist from Wired. He still believed in it, but he started analyzing, analyzing the helmet cam of Jarno. And this is his... Uh, analysis of the movement of the helmet cam. So it was really interesting to see all this uh, footage on the internet and to see how people reacted on it and started to play uh, the game of the hoax uh, with uh, Jarno. Um, but also the, the, the journalist from the Humo, in which, which I had an interview with for the, that's the Belgian magazine, um, he started to dig into Jarno's profile and started to call Philips and uh, the Coventry University and then he discovered that there was never, uh, there had never been uh, a Jan of Smates at Philips and also not at the Coventry University and not at built-in steering systems. So I started to feel the pressure of revealing this project as an art project instead of a real uh, wings, uh, flying wings project. So I decided to pick out the uh, Dutch prime time television show The Little Dry Door to reveal the truth. Uh, this is a small excerpt of this uh, show. Uh, this Jarno is inderdaad a fictive personage. Ja, ik ken Jarno. Ik heb alleen Jarno. Ik heb Floris Kruij. Floris Kruij wil gaan vanaf. Met jou, oké. Ik ben opnieuw. Uh, ik ben eigenlijk een filmmaker. Ja. Uh, en animator. Um, en ik heb dit project ben ik nu acht maanden mee bezig. Als een soort van experiment over online media. Hoe kan je een verhaal vertellen uh, via een blog? Applaus! Ja, And then after this show, uh, Floris Kijk and Jano Smeets were a worldwide trending topic at the same time. So a lot of people were following this Dutch television show. Uh, and after that a lot of tweets came about, uh, well a lot of people knew it wasn't real, but they still kind of appreciated uh, it. Like you see, it's still a better storyline than ever done. And well, I liked it that people uh, didn't feel really tricked, but they appreciated the, the artistic approach of my, uh, well, my project. Um, and at this moment, uh, the Human Bird Rings project is still continuing because uh, people are still talking about it. On YouTube, there are still discussions about if, is this real or is this not real. Um, and I like it that it's maybe it slowly becomes some kind of an urban legend. Okay, that was my. Uh, story about the human workers.
well, thank you, for, thank you, Floris, for sharing this uh, this amazing story uh, uh, with us. And I think it's it's really interesting how um, when you do online storytelling, how the the story space and the space of real life experience how they merge into each other. When you, when you use platforms that you usually use only in, in, in everyday life, you know, like LinkedIn or, or Facebook or Twitter, and all of a sudden your story sort of is, is going into those spaces. Right? You're trying to make it believable by building up all this profile on, on all these places. Um, and I was wondering, you know, how, how far do you, do you go in there? I mean, was there ever a moment where you were thinking, now I'm going too far? For example, at the moment that uh, a journalist from a you know, famous Belgian publication calls you up, and he says, I'm going to stand here because I think the microphone is uh, making a funny sound. But the, um, the journalist from the Belgium magazine is calling you up. And, and what do you do? Do you start acting in real life as young as Spades? Or did you ever doubt how far you should go? Or how did you deal with that? Uh, yeah, that was a very difficult uh, choice because I'm not an actor and I had to act with him. Um, and I also felt a bit guilty that I invited him to come over from Belgium and write an article, a serious journalist article about this uh, fake project or this well, storytelling project. Uh, so those were the difficult choices, but I thought such an article would be a nice part of the story because if somebody would, if this would be for real, then uh, he would also invite journalists. Um, it's, it's a nice part of my document, the document of the human project. And eventually, when he found out, how did he react? Did he feel cheated, or could he laugh about it? Or uh, he he called me the day after uh, the revelation or the reveal revealing in the the wereld draait door, and uh, he was pretty angry. Uh, but as, he he thought it was some kind of a commercial viral project for Nintendo, and as soon as he heard that it was an artistic project, he, he thought, well, it's uh, it's okay, it's a nice idea. And, and you said in the end, um, at a certain point, I decided to reveal that it was an art project and not a technological project. But to what extent was it actually a, a technological project? I mean, how much of the, the, the research and the prototypes, I mean, how, how much was that based on actual science or testing actual prototypes? Or was it complete fiction? Uh, we got a lot of uh, scientific information on the talks on the scientific forums, and people gave calculations about how big the wings should be and how fast they should move and uh, so it was pretty close to reality and we tried to make the design as plausible as possible so people maybe can continue uh, working on this are there any questions from the audience perhaps Anyone? yeah Yes, I, I heard of them. Because the, the yes men are two American, uh, what you call activists, and they do the same process. So, when it's art, they, of course, they say they, they, the goal they have is a political motive. Mm -hmm. And they remember that there's a tag mark here in the Britain, we just say by pretending to be uh, a person attending conferences, presenting technical equipment on torture. Which then people from various governments around the world buy yeah. to the political motivation. So I came a little bit later at least at the beginning of your presentation, and I was curious to know how you started off with the idea of flight. Why was flight rather than yeah. Oh, because this uh, question also, um, do you want to make a political statement as well? Because the yes men, you know, they do their their they're acting as a provocation to show that you know, something is wrong obviously in the world. Is that your question as well? Yeah, well, this was not a political project, it was a personal project because uh, it's also my personal dream to fly with wings like these. And that's why I started it initially. And uh, then I noticed that it's also a very universal thing, so I could share this story with a lot of people all over the world. Uh, no matter if, what kind of religion they have or what kind of language they speak, everybody shares this dream, I think. And, uh, but it started out of Personal, yeah. and with a personal fascination for the human body uh, in combination with the technological development. Is there anyone else who would like to ask uh, Jarno a question? Flores? Yeah? Was 
there an angle of media criticism in the project uh, and the way journalists check their facts before writing about something? Uh, it, there wasn't my setup, but I think uh, afterwards I got a lot of phone calls from students uh, studying journalism and they asked the same question. But for me, it was more about sharing my dream with, uh, with the world and visualizing uh, many, many others. Um, I have a final, oh, there's one other question. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you might have created a kind of precedent by doing this project, so how do you feel about others telling similar or different stories in a similar way? Would you, would you welcome that? Um, yeah, I think slowly the, uh, the line between fiction and fiction will disappear because of that. But, uh, I like those kind of projects, and it's also part of my previous films in which I used existing uh, media formats. And my film Metalos Maligna, I used some kind of uh, BBC channel media format, and I think it's good. Uh, it's a nice way to tell a story because you get completely involved uh, since you couldn't present, uh, can believe it. You're, yeah, you believe it more than when you see some kind of fictional piece in the cinema. So. Yeah, one more question. It's more sort of personal question to you. How did you feel when ABC started skyping you and all these media were jumping upon you? How, what did that do with you as a person? Um, it was very exciting. <laughs> and, um, because the day after the Wereld Draait Door, uh, ABC News wanted to have me live in their uh, in the news show and CBS, uh, also a television broadcaster from Canada. And uh, I thought I have to do it. I didn't really want it because I thought this is too uh, exciting to do. But I did it, and uh, right now I think it's a nice uh, experience. Maybe as a final question, you started out telling the stories in a more traditional linear format. Now you did the blog, where you spun the story out over, over many months. And you had all the, the audience engaging in it in many ways, you know, advising you. Uh, criticizing you, studying your images up to the very uh, last detail. For you as a filmmaker, how is this? How is this different? What did you find particularly interesting in doing it this way? Uh, the first thing I really like is that you get a much bigger audience than when you send your film to a film festival. Uh, even when a film is shown on very, very much film festivals, it's still a small audience. And now I had uh, nine million people, nine million people watching my videos. Um, it's also nice that there, you can enable uh, participation of the audience, audience participation, and people can react very uh, real time on it. And um, it's it's also nice that you can uh, spread out the story over eight months or something instead of uh, compressing it in eight minutes like you do with a short film. So I think this will change my way of working as a filmmaker. Your next project will be similar to this one. Yeah, I will try to uh, to involve transmedia storytelling. I think there was one more question here. Uh, I got the answer. Oh, you already got the answer. Yes. Okay. Well then, thank you again for Skype for sharing your story. Thank you. I would like to introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, Renko Vlaanderen.